Welcome to the Healthful Woman Podcast. Today's Thursday, November 19th, 2020. Before I introduce today's podcast, I want to give a big shout out to two of my amazing children, Noam and Kira Fox, who turn 21 on Sunday. I've come to grips with the fact that our little cuties, twin A and twin B, are now 21, but it still makes me feel really old. Mommy and I are super proud of you and the adults you have become, and we are so excited to see what lies ahead. We love you guys. Also, Kira, Thanks for being such an active listener and supporter of the podcast and a guest. Do me a favor and let Noam know to listen because I gave him a shout out. I suspect he otherwise would not be too interested in today's topic, which leads me to today's topic. Today we start a five-part miniseries on breastfeeding, and it's about time. This has probably been our most requested topic and for good reason. All pregnant women either plan to breastfeed or have questions about breastfeeding or are considering not breastfeeding, so just on the face of it, it is a relevant topic. But on top of that, breastfeeding has become a very charged topic emotionally and politically, and there are very wide opinions regarding the health benefits, public policy, and work-related policies. And we wanted to address as much of that as we can. In today's podcast, I'm joined by Dr. Stephanie Melka to discuss breastfeeding, the doctor's perspective. Melka is a great resource as she is an OBGYN. She is a mom who breastfed her daughter, including pumping when she returned to a very busy job and she has continued her education related to the medical aspects of breastfeeding. Next week, we'll have two podcasts with Melissa Kotlin, who is a lactation consultant, and the following week, we'll have two podcasts with Courtney Jung, who is the author of a terrific book called Lactivism. I'm really excited about this miniseries, and I hope it will be helpful to anyone who's considering breastfeeding or anyone who's just interested to hear about this fascinating topic. Thanks for listening. Have a great day and a great weekend. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. All right, Melka, welcome back to Healthful Woman. Glad you're here to talk about breastfeeding. How you doing? Doing well. How are you? I'm wonderful. You've taken an interest in breastfeeding from the, the medical side of it, and you actually did some extra education and training in it, correct? Yes. So tell everyone, what'd you do? What's that about? There's a whole world out there of breastfeeding medicine, and it's sort of fills the gap in what physicians don't necessarily learn in residency, whether it be OB or pediatrics or whatever, and the role of the lactation consultant. Lactation consultants are wonderful. They do a lot of teaching, problem solving, but they don't diagnose or treat. So that's sort of where we come in. Right. And so is that in general what the role of the doctor is, or have you found that that differs from doctor to doctor or from woman to woman? Differs a lot. There's also a big regional difference. Last year, I did a training course with IABLE in specifically breastfeeding medicine or breastfeeding for the healthcare provider. And what I realized is in New York, there's so many good services here. There's Mm -hmm. lactation consultants, there's groups that meet that work on breastfeeding stuff. And a lot of other places don't necessarily have that. For our patients, some of it is patient driven. Some might be have certain medical issues leading them to find a physician. Some are more motivated than others. If they're having problems with breastfeeding, I think it's also a doctor thing as well. You know, some doctors just don't have an interest in it. Why do you think that is? Do you think it's just they view it as not part of their world, meaning this isn't medical, so to speak? Or is it just they maybe don't have experienced it themselves or because we're not taught as much during training. It's all of that. You know, it's hard to pick up knowledge and do something medical when you're not taught it in a clinical sense. You know, you can take a course and read and learn about it, but then to actually take that and apply it to a patient, I think some people are uncomfortable with that. I think some physicians don't always understand the importance of breastfeeding and why a woman might really want to feed. And it's easy to just say like, oh, you don't have to do that. Just give formula. And I think they might not see the need as well. Right. I mean, I know for our own training, we learned about breastfeeding, but most of it was really treating complications of breastfeeding, like how to treat mastitis or, you know, potentially which is a medical problem or whatever it is. But there was very little on just normal, healthy breastfeeding other than potentially those first 
you know, few days in the hospital when we saw the women because we really had no contact with women after they delivered for many months, except maybe at their postpartum visit, where usually you're talking, it's already two months afterwards. You know, frequently they, they, they're doing it, or they're not doing it mm-hmm. at that point. And it's really just a question that we had, are you breastfeeding? How's it going? Yeah. And that was really all it was. And so they're just, I think there's since when there's not training, there's this decreased level of comfort in talking about it, because what if she is having difficulties breastfeeding? I'd be like, well, what am I going to do about it? Like, I, <laughs> like, oh, okay. Like, and so, okay, you can maybe connect them with someone. But when, you know, doctors get very uncomfortable frequently when we don't understand something as well, which is a shame because, you know, you could refer to somebody else, but it's just sort of the nature. And what motivated you to do this extra training? Probably when I first had my now two and a half year old, Allison, and I you know, was like, let me try breastfeeding. Let me see how it goes. And in going through it, you realize how much misinformation is out there, how a lot of what's out there is contradictory. You'll see one resource that says you should do this. And then another resource that says, don't do that, do this. And then a third that's like, no, all of that is wrong. Try this. You know, it's interesting to me looking at the medicine behind it and how all of those things can be right in the right settings. Right, that it's based on who it is yes. potentially. Yeah. And w- when you were breastfeeding, was there anything about it that surprised you compared to what you thought it was going into as a doctor? Let's say it's really hard, and I had an appreciation for that hearing from women, but it it's hard. You know, I make a living out of functioning on no sleep mm-hmm. and of getting up in the middle of the night and doing something and going back to sleep. And it's, you know, it, it wears on you. First couple of weeks, you're up, you know, every three hours, you're feeding the baby, putting the baby on. And, you know, after a week, I'm like, now I understand why women are like, nope, going to sleep all night. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and was there anything that you maybe learned about breastfeeding just from your own experience, maybe on the medical side that you didn't learn in training or know as a doctor or from talking to patients? A lot of stuff about engorgement, sore nipples, cracked nipples, how to tell if the baby's feeding enough, how to tell if the baby's feeding too much, how strong is the letdown, like tons of stuff that I just, you know, we get zero education on. As a doctor, when do you start talking to patients about breastfeeding? Is it while they're pregnant? Is it after they deliver? When do you have that conversation? I bring it up Sometime around 28, 32 weeks, specifically because that's when women start looking into getting a breast pump at home and Mm -hmm. getting it through insurance. And Mm -hmm. insurances won't usually cover it until towards the end of pregnancy. What are those conversations like when you have? Is it just sort of, are you planning on it and it's yes or no, or is it usually longer conversations? I generally start open-ended. What are your plans on feeding? Because I don't mean for any of this to be pushing breastfeeding if somebody doesn't want to or can't or chooses not to. Right. I just ask them what are their plans. And if they say, I want to nurse, but I understand it's going to be tough. And then I start talking about things to start doing now, which is basically like looking into what insurance covers, getting a breast pump at home, getting the extra stuff at home, like a comfortable chair, a breastfeeding pillow. And then there's a lot of good resources online that I'll start referring them to as well. And what concerns do they seem to have during pregnancy when they say they heard that it might be hard? Are they talking about sort of logistically or, you know, in terms of their life, meaning going back to work and their family? Is it more just the breastfeeding itself or is it all across? It's everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I think our generation, when we were babies, we would be fed, but then we would be given formula. And a lot of our parents will say, oh, we just get formula. It's okay. Or women almost find they're getting discouraged from the start, just being told it's going to hurt. It's going to be difficult. It usually doesn't work out. So a lot of it is just that emotional support. And then so when you're addressing these concerns, do you find that it's more just giving them you know, positive reinforcements like, hey, if you want to do it, you can do it. We can help. There's mm-hmm. resources. Or is it really actually addressing specific issues? Some of the specific questions I get are about going back to work. And it's so funny that at 32 weeks, right. you're not planning for what like the first, I don't know, six, eight, 12 weeks are going to be. It's what am I going to do after that when I'm back at work? So some of it is like helping with those specifics. Some of it is just going over different like support groups, websites, ways to like learn about it. And then some of it is just the emotional. Women have a hard time responding. Like if a woman says, well, I want to breastfeed and the husband says, 
well, I don't think you should because of X, Y, and Z. I think it's hard for people to navigate those conversations. I think it's also interesting what you said about returning to work because you know, sometimes when we're facing potential challenge or whatever it is, you know, everyone's thinking long term. But the truth is, don't decide now what you're doing. You go back to work because first of all, who the hell knows what's going to happen? I mean, who who could have predicted that all of us would be working from home right at this <laughs> point in time? So you don't know what's going to be. Some people after they have a baby say, you know what? I'm going to change what my work's going to look like. Some do, some don't. And that's like a decision that doesn't have to be made so early. And I think most of the data demonstrates that the best way to set yourself up for a longer time breastfeeding is to get it right in the first couple of weeks. Yeah. If it's successful, if it's not painful, if you're able to do mm-hmm. it well and you know, sort of get everything set up early, that's really the key. And so someone who's you know, motivated and interested and wants to breastfeed, which is great, I would just say, okay, what am I going to do after the baby's born? Yeah. Like the first day, the first two days, the first week, and focus on that, not so much the long-term planning, because the long-term planning will be irrelevant if yeah. the first week is very difficult and you know you can't get past that. That's actually one of the places people get a lot of misinformation. Breast milk supply is all supply and demand, mm-hmm. and that's part of the rationale behind latching the baby very often in the first few weeks. And what a lot of people don't realize is the baby will transfer milk better than a breast pump. So some women will say, well, I'm not going to directly feed, but I'm just going to pump because I'm going to be pumping anyway when I go back to work. And that can often set up for difficulty at first because it doesn't establish as good of a supply and it's much more challenging to do logistically in terms of like pump parts and bottles and everything. And again, it's the right thing for some women. Some women don't want the physical aspect of nursing. They just want to pump. And that's fine. It shouldn't always be the place to start. Right. I mean, all of it is obviously fine. But I think also one of the misinformations that women get is regarding the benefits of breastfeeding, which there are, obviously. But one of the big benefits of breastfeeding is the actual breastfeeding Mm -hmm. above and beyond the milk. Meaning, in fact, I think most of the data shows that the breastfeeding component is a huge contributor Mm -hmm. towards health. The for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, the bonding, the skin to skin touch, the warmth, there's so much about that, that we, we know, but don't quite understand. And then there's also the milk aspect. And so whatever decision they're going to make, obviously, is going to be okay. But it's just something they need to realize that when we talk about breastfeeding, it's not just make sure your baby has breast milk. It's Mm -hmm. that idea. And plus, you know, for mothers that that bonding for them is very important. And for many women, it is very helpful as part of the recovery from birth. For others, not. You know, for others, it's just something that can't sleep anymore. And that's not a good thing. But for many women, it is really a positive aspect of their recovery. And that's something that shouldn't be minimized. Yeah. Okay. So you you have this conversation with women, you're you're talking about it, which is great. And then they deliver. What is your role after delivery in those first few days when she's still in the hospital and encouraging or helping her with breastfeeding if that's what she's doing? So the biggest thing early on is helping women establish a good latch. How the baby latches onto the breast is sort of physiologic, but sometimes it doesn't always go well. And that can lead to issue with pain, with decreased milk transfer, and then decreased supply. So initially, a lot of it is like just hands on, like here's how to hold the baby. Here's how to hold your breast. Here's how to get the baby on. Here's how to make sure the baby stays on. Here's how to wake up the baby, all of that stuff. Once the mom goes home, that's where I think the lactation consultants are really helpful. Like I'm not doing home visits, you know, but lactation consultants are. And that is so valuable in terms of let's look at your physical space. Where are you feeding? Is this physically comfortable for you? Is that what's leading to pain? And then from there, women would end up coming back to me if they're having problems. You know, the most common we see is mastitis. Sometimes it's just fever from engorgement, overall pain, occasionally low milk supply, other medical issues that could be contributing as well. Right. I think that a lot of the early breastfeeding instructions help it come from a variety of people. And it doesn't, you know, you don't need a medical degree. You don't need, you know, necessarily a lactation consulting mm-hmm. degree to help women with nursing. I mean, uh, the postpartum nurses, they do this all day, every day yeah. with women. And, you know, whether they're formally certified or not, like they know what they're doing. And mm-hmm. so they're very, very helpful. And for most women in the hospital, either they've done it before, or even for first time mothers, the the nurses help them or maybe a family member. And that's really it. And they're not going to require any consultants to come in and help them nurse. But the consultants are there because 
it isn't easy for all women. Mm -hmm. And for some women, even with the help of the nurse or someone in their family, it's not going right. And the lactation consultants, their training, a lot of it is, it's so much just experience, right? That they've seen a lot of different things and they've seen a lot of common issues and they sort of understand, you know, the anatomy of it and the yeah. physiology, of it, physiology of it, like you said. And they just have a lot of, for lack of a better word, tricks for how to yeah. get things done in a certain way. And they're really, really helpful in that regard. And like you said, they're a resource for women after they go home if available. And I think even if they're not available in your region or maybe it's cost prohibitive, there's so much online in terms of reading, in terms of images, in terms of videos that you can find that can be really helpful. And if it's not working, you could also go back to your OB mm -hmm. and sometimes a pediatrician depends on, you know, how comfortable they are and just ask like how comfortable are you, you know, with helping me with breastfeeding and the doctor will say I'm very comfortable or I'm totally uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, and, and everything in between, but there are a lot of resources. So let's talk about some of those complications that you mentioned the women might come back or to see medical care. And when you mentioned mastitis and engorgement, so explain what those are and what's the difference between those two. So engorgement is when the breast tissues are getting swollen, you sort of have too much milk built up that's not transferring out. And then mastitis is an infection in part of the breast. Right. And sometimes they're hard to tell apart from each other sort of on the phone or whatever, because in both situations, there's pain and there's fever. Yes. <laughs> and I, I think you know, engorgement is also what happens if women are not going to nurse. Frequently will happen to them after birth or if they stop nursing, right? Because at a certain point, the milk's coming in, but it's not coming out. And then mastitis, they don't have to be engorged to have mastitis. They could just have an infection in the breast. And so how do you differentiate those two, let's say, over the phone? How would you possibly figure that out? It's very challenging over the phone. What I'm finding lately is women are calling me saying, I have mastitis. I have a red spot on my mm. breast. I looked it up online mm. already. Yeah. Google um, said I have mastitis. Yeah. yeah. Google's um, right. Yes. <laughs> typically, mastitis pre presents with a red blotch on yeah. the breast. Like, and it, that area specifically is warm, is swollen to the touch, whereas engorgement is more general. Right. And us, engorgement will frequently be in both breasts, mm -hmm. whereas mastitis yeah. can be in both breasts, but usually it's in one of the two breasts. Mm -hmm. And they, she can say, like, it's on you know, the left side of my right breast, like she can say specifically, like where it hurts the most, where is that red um, sort of like wedge that you can see. They're treated really pretty straightforward. I mean, for mastitis, it's just typically antibiotics and yeah. she'll get better almost always. Not mm -hmm. always. Sometimes there's, you know, there's an abscess that develops and needs like more intense treatment, but that's really the exception. Pretty yeah. much everybody's just antibiotics and it's safe to nurse with mastitis. Encouraged uh, to nurse. Yeah. You want, you don't want that milk because it's sort of thought to be a milk stasis issue where the milk's not draining and mm -hmm. that's what led to the infection. You want to keep nursing or pumping fine to feed the milk. It's not infectious in any way. Right. In fact, the bacteria came from the baby's mouth frequently right. anyway. So you're, yeah. it's just going back there. Whereas engorgement is tough. I mean, because there's treatment if she is nursing and the mm -hmm. treatment if she's not nursing. Yeah. Right. So wh why is that? What's the difference? Well, if you're not nursing, you want to be decreasing the production of milk. So you're going to be recommending tight bras, like sports bra tight, as long as you can handle it during the day and night, ice packs, and interestingly, Sudafed decreases supply. I've heard of a couple different dosing regimens, but I'll usually tell people like follow the instructions on the packaging for whatever formula it is for like a day. And I think it decreases supply by like 60% within 48 hours or something crazy remarkable like that. Right. But if you have somebody who's still nursing, you don't want to be decreasing the supply. You want to be down regulating it a little bit because when you're, again, looking at supply and demand, you're supplying too much and it's not being removed. Right. And the issue is if someone is not nursing and they're engorged, yes, if they were to pump, mm -hmm. they're going to feel better. But it's just going to keep that Produce cycle going, more, yeah. right? They're going to, it's going to get either, either not get better or potentially get worse. Yeah. I think there is a role for it, like kind of get rid of some of the milk, right. get some comfort, but don't like pump till there's nothing and then continuing the other measures. Right. And the tight sports bras, you know, that pressure is very helpful. The ice is helpful. Not putting a lot of mm -hmm. like, you know, when women take a shower, not yeah. having as much heat, you know, you know, stand with your back to the shower, for example. And typically, if that's the reason someone's engorged, it's going to get better within a couple of days. You know, for a couple of days, they'll be sore. They'll have a low-grade fever. You can take Tylenol, and it'll eventually, you know, typically it'll pass in a couple of days, whereas mastitis won't, right? Mm -hmm. Mastitis will, I mean, can 
heal itself, but frequently it's not going to, and they're going to get worse unless it's treated. You can do a culture of the breast milk, mm -hmm. which doesn't give you an immediate answer, but super simple. You just clean the nipple with alcohol and then wash it with saline and then just have mom express into a sterile cup and the lab can grow out bacteria. Initially, you know, some women are like, I think I have mastitis. I really want to take antibiotics. I don't want this to get bad. And then others will say, well, I don't want to take antibiotics. Let, let's wait. Let's see what happens if we're not sure. So the culture sometimes helps in that setting as well. Right. And sometimes you actually find it, it could be fungus like yeast mm -hmm. that could be in there as well. I don't know that mm -hmm. that would grow out because I think the lab would typically, you know, it's a bacterial culture. Oh, they have to culture it, would, it differently. Yeah. Maybe put in a smear or whatnot. I don't know how they would do that. I would have to check. What kind of nipple problems do you see women come back with? Typically general sore nipples or cracked nipples. The soreness usually goes away within a few days, but then the cracked nipples often comes from the baby not latching correctly. So if the baby's latch is asymmetric, when the baby's nursing, that suction is going to be, there's going to be an asymmetry of where it's distributed on the nipple and then leading to cracking or fissures. And then how do you treat those? With saline soaks. You take a little shot glass, mm -hmm. and you, you make like a warm saline mixture. I think it's, mm -hmm. I, I forget the exact proportions, but you put saline in it and then just let the nipple soak in it for like 10 minutes at a time, a few times a day. And it really helps to clean it and promote healing. There's different like patches and stuff that people get to like, like hydrogel patches, which can help with healing as well. But I think the saline soaks are really underrated for those. What have you found in terms of how charged this is for your patients, for women, in terms of whether they are or aren't nursing and how it's going for them? Do you find that most people are sort of like, you know, they go with, you know, so to speak, go with the flow or, <laughs> or, or, or are people sort of very invested emotionally in this? It's the number one reason I'll make a woman cry <laughs> at the postpartum <laughs> visit when That's I ask. Nice of, you. Right, yeah. of course. How is feeding going? And she'll start talking and talk, and then all of a sudden, like the tears well up, and it's like I can't do it. I had to switch to formula, or it's I'm doing it, but I'm so miserable. I can't believe like I haven't slept in more than two hours at a time in the last six weeks. So it it is very very charged, and I think women are very hard on themselves. You know, I have a handful of patients that say, yeah, I tried, it didn't work. So I'm doing some nursing, some formula, and I'm fine with that. But I think there's a lot of guilt when that ends up happening. It's a problem that there's guilt yeah. over this. And, I, you know, we're having two podcasts with, you know, <laughs> with this, with the, with the woman who authored a book called Lactivism, which is basically pro breastfeeding, yeah. but anti guilt. Right. Or breastfeeding, meaning this is a it's a decision every woman makes. It is not easy for all women. For some, it's a breeze. And for some, it's mm -hmm. like, this is great. I love it. I'm going to do this for two years. And others are like, this is like the worst thing that ever happened to me. And there's everything in between. Mm -hmm. It's an individualized decision. It's a personal choice. And it's not just a personal choice, like what's my preference, but it's also it goes differently for different women. Yeah. And it means different things to different women. And it has a different impact on different women's lives logistically, mm -hmm. emotionally. And so it has to be individualized in that sense. Yeah. If you had to give sort of your your top advice to women who are interested, mm -hmm. right? So we'll start with that group. They're interested in nursing. They're excited about breastfeeding. They they want to do it. What would be the advice you would give them either, you know, beforehand, during, after? Like, what are the things that you find are really the most helpful for them? Again, I think a lot of it is more emotional support than actual mm -hmm. medical advice. But I do tell women, you know, if you have the resources and the means, find a lactation consultant to work with you the first few days. You'll have that in, you know, for us, we have that in the hospital, but it's helpful at home. The physical stuff, again, be prepared with it. And then just emotionally, sort of like birth, you don't know what's going to happen until it happens. And right. as much as there are benefits to it, it doesn't always work. It's not always as easy as you want it to be. And you just have to Try it and see how things go. Ask for help as you need and work through it as best you can. And I tell people, if it doesn't work, it's okay. You know, right. if you do give formula, don't think of it as, oh, I have to give formula. It's that you're choosing to, that right. it's the right thing for you and your baby and your family. Right. I think that's a great analogy with birth that there's, you know, everyone has this, this vision of yeah. what it's going to be like. And sometimes it works out that way. But it's unpredictable. Sometimes it mm -hmm. doesn't. And it doesn't mean anyone did anything wrong or there's something wrong with you. Like that's how it happens sometimes. And the same is true with breastfeeding. It doesn't always work out the way you think it is. And that's that's okay. What about for women who come in and say, I 
don't plan on nursing. Again, I don't exist to talk people into it, but I usually ask them why. You know, sometimes they say, well, my first time it was really tough or I've heard bad stories or I'm just not interested in it. And that's fine. But I often find in that setting, I uncover like questions they have or problems that I can, you know, help work through. You know, in terms of not breastfeeding, I don't give specific formula recommendations. Like there's a lot of sort of controversy out there now of like, U.S. versus European formulas and which ones are healthier. And you have women spending like three times as much money getting like fancy German formulas. Like, I wow, I know. Also, imagine what three times the cost of formula it's because formula is expensive it's, to it's, start. Yeah, I, I don't know the exact number. It's a lot more expensive. But again, I, that sounds sketchy to me. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know anything about this. But that just that just seems like not necessary. But yeah, I tell women, you know, have formula ready at home, mm-hmm. you know, try different types of formulas. There's ones that are bottled that are pre-made. There's the powder that you mix, you know, have the bottles ready at home. And then all the engorgement stuff, have tight bras, ice packs, frozen peas is a wonderful type Mm -hmm. of ice pack. (laughs) You just keep throwing it back in the freezer and then, you know, starting Sudafed if you're getting engorged. Right. I think people underestimate the cost both of formula feeding and breastfeeding. Yeah. There's cost to both. I mean, there's, I mean, it's obviously time, but even taking that aside, you know, formula is very expensive, Mm -hmm. but breastfeeding is equipment, right? There's, you know, there's pumps and the pillows and, you know, the, you know, all the stuff that's going to go along with it. I remember when our twins were born and they were not breastfed. And so you're talking about formula for two kids and we were you know, broke, right? <laughs> so <laughs> like, you know, we're, we got no, so. You were in med school at yeah, the time, it was, right? Yeah, it was quite a scene. So I actually found whoever the rep was, the, you know, the, the hospital, there is, there is formula in hospitals for babies who need it. And the hospitals typically get it for free from the companies that do this because they're thinking, okay, if you know, the hospital gives it, then you know people go home and use it. Mm-hmm. That's a business decision. Okay, fine. And so I found the two big companies and I found their drug rep for the Sinai. And I called both of us and listen, I'm a med student. I'm broke. <laughs> we got twins. And honestly, they were so kind. I mean, you could say that maybe they're trying to influence me. I have no idea, but I don't ever recommend specific formula. But they sent us cases, not cans, cases of formula so we had basically you know whatever i don't know you know you feed the formula a year or something whatever it was basically for free it was like the greatest thing that ever happened to our you know accounting (laughs) because that's awesome yeah oh it was so nice of them i really i'm sure they were trying to influence you of course they Um. were but i was like all right you know but but i had both companies working against each other which was nice so I'm I'm certainly not biased one or the other. It was just very <laughs> kind to them because I mean honestly, the, if we had to pay for that, it just would have been gruesome. <laughs> I can't imagine the kind of debt for formula because uh, my kids ate a lot when they were, when they, were <laughs> they were growing up. Let's talk about going back to work because that is, as you said, something people are very concerned about or they have a lot of questions about. They're even asking you while they're pregnant. So first, what was your experience like going back to work? Because I I know you went back to work. <laughs> well, you definitely did go back to work at some point, and you certainly were still nursing at that time. Yeah. So what was your experience like? I was lucky. I had a very positive experience going back to work. I had an easy breastfeeding journey. Mm-hmm. I was lucky. I had minimal problems. It went really well. Again, like I handled the sleep deprivation better than anyone, I think. But then, you know, when I went back to work, it was a pretty easy transition. So you need time to pump during the day. And the time interval in between pumps is different for each person, you know. So if you're somebody with a low storage capacity, meaning when you pump, you pump two ounces and that's it. No matter how long you wait, you're going to have to be pumping more frequently. You know, some women can hold more milk between pumps and not lose their supply and will only need to pump once or twice during the day. So logistically, you have to figure out how often that time is going to be during the day. I think when I came back, I emailed you and Oshra and just said, like, I need time to pump, like, don't overbook my lunch. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm going to take like a 15 minute in the morning and a 15 minute in the afternoon somewhere in between patients and just sort of made it work. I would pump on the way to work while driving, which Mm -hmm. I, again, I did not learn about until like I joined a Facebook group of physician moms who were all like, you have to pump while driving. It's the best thing ever. (laughs) Like, this is such a time saver. I love it. (laughs) You pulled over. Hello, officer. Right. (laughs) I was waiting for that to happen. I'm sure there's like 
easy pass photos of me going <laughs> over the bridge with like <laughs> the things set up in front of me. Okay, can you plug it into the car? There are adapters. They make for like the Medela or the like full size, not nursing, not like mm -hmm. travel pumps, ones that you can plug in. There's also ones that have a rechargeable battery, right. um, but they sell like the adapters for the car. Right. <laughs> Plus, I know that you certainly were very comfortable pumping I you was, know, and ar I think, around others. Yeah. And I think for the most part, people were fine with it. Like I know we had like administrative meetings that I was just like, I'm going to be pumping. And you were like, okay. And like, you didn't bat an eye. It didn't bother you. At Whatever. All. It's and all good. Yeah. Other people, not so much. Like other people were like, I don't want to bother you. You're pumping. Like, I'm like, I don't care. Like, why does this bother you more than it bothers me? And I think that that's a shared experience among women. You know, yes, they all notice they're like, other people are more uncomfortable with this than I am. It is a very interesting, I don't know, psychological or sociological phenomenon about others' yeah. responses to pumping or nursing around mm -hmm. others. And it's, I don't know, it's so interesting. Like some people walk by like, oh, that's so beautiful. It's great. You know, good for you. Great. And others are like, oh my God, like, and they're freaked out by it. And it's, I, I don't, it's so interesting. Yeah. I don't really understand it. Some people will say like, you're uncomfortable because you're sexualizing it. And mm -hmm. like, there's that whole thing, like, you know, breasts are meant to feed babies. They're not meant to be sexual. And because right. you think they're sexual, that's why. Most people I asked, because I did ask, like when people were bothered by it, they were like, I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. And right. I had to keep saying like, but I don't care. <laughs> right. I think, it's, I think it's just deeper down in the brain than that. I think, I it's, think it's just it something is. that's just visceral that some people, for whatever reason, when they were three years old. I mean, who knows? <laughs> but it's just something about and because people can't even, you know, often articulate exactly why no. you get sort of a, an odd feeling about it. And I don't I One don't, yeah, I don't think actually, it's I don't think it's sinister in that yeah. way. I just think it's some people just feel that way. It's weird. I, I won't name who it is publicly. <laughs> <laughs> but one person was like, I just don't like thinking of you like a dairy cow. And I was like, thank you for being honest. Like, that's the best explanation I've got for all this. Right. Okay. It just makes you uncomfortable. Fine. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I know that also at the hospital, you know, because that's, that's tough. I yeah. mean, it's hard to carve out 15 minutes at the hospital. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. There is a pump room at Mount Sinai. So like there are laws about this. Like when right. you have a certain number of employees, you have to have like dedicated space and this and that. It's in the basement of Annenberg. If you're walking like to the Annenberg elevators you'll you've walked yep, past it sure. and never noticed it no, I've probably noticed until it. i pointed it out to you because yeah, yeah. it doesn't say anything on right. it but it's one room it's like a with, radioactive sign so no right. one else goes in yes. there yeah. <laughs> there's three chairs there's three of the hospital grade pumps and there's no sign up you just like walk in and if you can use it you use it but that also means you have to be able to leave the labor floor to get there. We've asked in the past and the response is sort of like well we that's the the hospital space you can't the hospital's not going to give a shared room in every single building, which like I get, like you just don't have the space for that, especially in New York. But I would usually go up to the call room and pump. I would right. like bring one of the hospital pumps upstairs and like sit in the call room. And if I couldn't even leave the floor, I would sit in the doctor's lounge. Yes. I think, you know, one of the OB residents at the time was also pumping. And there were days she and I were sitting next to each other, like typing on the computer, like, you know, covered up pumping with the little pumps next to us. And mm -hmm. Half the time, people didn't even like notice what we were doing. Yeah, everyone's in their own world there. Yeah, it's like, and also plus like whatever you know. We had one one moment. Someone came by and was like, "Why aren't you moving your section?" And I was like, "I'm pumping. I asked the resident to move. I will be back. Like this is not going to be delayed for me." And then like one of the women and like the food got there and like the women are like, "Oh my god, let me bring you your food," because I'm like attached to the pump like trying to move over to the table to get my food and it obviously wasn't working was there anything that surprised you about colleagues or you know people you're around either positively or negatively about people your experience were very supportive women who nursed more than women who didn't nurse and men who had gone through it with their partners mm -hmm. rather than men who didn't so i think it's like a real it speaks to like having to actually go through it right, like a to community. understand what it's like. Like yes. being part of the, the nursing community. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of women don't have that experience. They find yeah. it very difficult, a lot of obstacles, a lot of mm -hmm. roadblocks to find, which is unfortunate because it's like- But I think like I, I would do sections with like you or Rebarber and we'd get towards the end and I'd be like, 
I'm going to go pump and do all the paperwork. And you'd be like, all right, I'll finish and I'll move the patient. And like, that was it. Right. And I mean, because I can't pump and do right. the paperwork. So I mean, <laughs> may as well you efficiency. do it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one, if one of us has to do it, that's fine. It's interesting when we, when we were designing the rebuild of our synagogue, we actually specifically put in a pumping area. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, it actually wasn't a pumping area. It's more of a nursing area. Yeah. I think most women weren't going to come to synagogue and pump. I mean, some, I guess, and could, but most of them were going to come with their babies and actually nurse. So we had an area that was for both. And it was, I remember vividly because someone actually was really upset at me personally for not designing an area for nursing. I was like, no, we did. <laughs> like, I was like, I was, and I showed them the lens. I'm like, here it is. Like, circled it. Like, oh, okay, great. Have a good day. <laughs> it was like the most, you know, I guess they just assumed it wouldn't have. I was like, yeah, no, we got to do that. I mean, it's, um, and then they say, like, oh, it's because you don't want to pump in synagogue, whatever. It was a whole thing. We're like, do whatever you want. It's all good. You can pump on Shabbos, right? Is that, that, that would I, be medical. I, I assume so. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, it's okay with me. I don't know. I mean, again, I think most, but most people wouldn't need to pump. On Sarah, because they're going to nurse. Yeah. Right. And so I don't think they want it. I don't think they want to. I mm -hmm. don't know the answer to that question. I'll, I'll, I'll say I'm, I'm okay with it. <laughs> Do you have any tips for women yes. who are going to work themselves? Yeah. The, the first is just sort of like being open about it, like telling your employer like what time you need, like what you need set aside. You need to have milk at home for the baby to feed while you're back at work. The few weeks before you go back, it's helpful to start pumping a little bit extra during the day to start freezing milk and having something stashed for when you go back. This is another area of misinformation. Like you'll see some sources will say like right away you should pump twice a day in addition to the nursing so you can get extra. And then other places say don't do that because that's going to lead to oversupply. So what I usually tell women is if you start like about two weeks before you go back, you'll get enough. And you, you don't need like a full freezer worth of milk. Right. Like, you would think you if, need... you, if you pump on Monday, that's the milk you exact, can use for Tuesday. Exactly. Right. Exactly. You need, you need at least one right. day ahead. You need at least one day ahead. And I think it's nice to have a little bit extra because like right. you spill something or you heat the bottle and the baby right. doesn't take it and then you can't reuse it again. So starting that ahead of time. There's more devices out now that are designed to collect letdown from the contralateral breast when you're nursing. Mm -hmm. So if you're latching the baby on the right side, you'll get a letdown on both sides. Mm -hmm. And typically you just leak and that's what the breast pads are for. But they make these little like cup with like a hole in it that mm -hmm. you just put on your breast and mm -hmm. it'll collect that letdown. And then you can start freezing that. You need to store milk without actually pumping. Without having to pump. Right. Yeah. And without having to disrupt like the whole supply demand thing. Right. Otherwise, I usually tell people like two, three weeks before you go back to work, you know, pump once or twice a day. Morning is typically better. That's when prolactin levels are higher. So you'll get more of an output with one pump. So to, you know, usually tell people like wake up, feed the baby, pump, freeze that. And then the day before you go back to work, you start thawing everything out. Helpful, but not required to, to f use some of that milk to actually feed the baby at home, like have somebody else give the baby a bottle just so the baby starts learning how to feed from a bottle and not the breast. But there's a lot of people that will just say like the baby will figure it out. So that I don't think is as, as necessary. So yeah, have the milk ready and it's what you pump on Monday is going to be used Tuesday. So it's just having that like one day extra and then maybe a little bit more. Wow, that's great. <laughs> and what about when women are thinking of stopping or weaning? Go slowly. <laughs> stopping all at once is generally going to lead to issues with engorgement, pain, fever, and a higher likelihood of mastitis. So if it's possible, I usually suggest dropping a feed at a time. If you're pumping exclusively by that point, usually when women are weaning, they're at work. So they're pumping and then direct feeding at home, but pumping for less time and then less frequency throughout the day. And it's just go slowly. You know, you don't want to put yourself into an engorgement. It's slowly days, weeks, months. Like, what are we talking about? Different for each person. Uh -huh. You know, typically a week or two. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen some women, it takes a month because they drop a pump and then they wake up and they're completely engorged. Then they'll pump out like 10 ounces at a time or something. And it just takes longer for them to downregulate. Again, the Sudafed can help if women want to go faster. And estrogen 
birth control. Right. You know, so some women also by that time are like, okay, I'm weaning, I'm ready to go on combined birth control. So the estrogen can help as well. Wow. Melka, this is great. <laughs> Thank you for coming on to talk about this. Thank you for your interest in breastfeeding and for helping all of our patients, both in our practice and now out in the world. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman Podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.